is Science Max. Experiments at large. Science Max! Greetings, Science Maximites. Welcome to Science Max. Experiments at large. My name is Phil, and today on Science Max, we're going to be harnessing the awesome power of lightning! <laughs> How are we harnessing the power of lightning, you ask? With this balloon. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, what's similar between a balloon and lightning? Well, nothing right now. But behold, as I use the power of static electricity and rub the balloon on my head. Because basically, that's how it starts. You see, when I rub this balloon on my head, it's stealing electrons from me creating a positive charge in my hair and a negative charge in the balloon. And the interesting thing is, you know that things with opposite charges attract each other, right? Something that has a positive charge will attract negative things and vice versa. But anything with a charge will attract anything with a neutral charge. See all these things on the table? They all have a neutral charge, which means they've got equal amounts of positive and negative. Right now, this balloon is building up a big negative charge, which means it will be attracted to all of these things. This can of Science Max Soda, it has a neutral charge. The balloon has a negative charge, which means the can will be attracted to the balloon. And this paper is neutrally charged, which means the paper will be attracted to the balloon. And if you hold the negatively charged balloon next to neutrally charged sugar, ha ha, sugar storm. And you probably, wait, I don't want to get sugar in my hair. And you probably know this trick. If you rub a balloon on your head, you can stick it on the wall. Ha ha! But what does any of this have to do with lightning? Well, the same thing is going on with a lightning bolt. The clouds become negatively charged, and that negative charge wants to equalize itself with the ground, which is neutrally charged. And that lightning bolt is the electricity jumping from one place to another. And you can see this yourself. If you rub a balloon on your head and you put it next to something metal, like a doorknob, there'll be a spark. But here's another thing you can do if you don't have a balloon, which I guess I don't anymore. Rub your feet, if you're wearing socks, on a carpet, and then turn out all the lights and touch a doorknob. You might be able to see a spark jump from your finger to the door. That's lightning in a very, very small form. So that's what we want to do today on Science Max Experiments at Large. Max out lightning! I think I'm going to go to the Ontario Science Centre and ask Heather her advice. She really knows her stuff. I'm going to go see if she's busy right now. Come on. Phil, you just... got the portal fixed. So... Well, it's not exactly fixed. It's. Still got a couple bugs that I'm ironing out, but I stopped coming in 10 feet above the floor. Hey. So that's a, a step in the right direction. Anyway, Heather, <laughs> I've come here because I want to ask your advice on something. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. So what I am doing is creating lightning. So this is where I'm at right now. So this is a balloon. I blow up the balloon, and then I rub it on my head, and it creates a static charge, right? right? Yeah. Just like in the lightning bolt between the clouds and the ground. And the ground. So I was wondering if I was wondering if you could help me maybe max that out and I thought the perfect place to start would be a larger balloon. Ooh, right on. Actually, yeah, I like this. Yeah. Um, I've got a big balloon if you just give me a second. Sure. All right, catch. Okay. All right, giant balloon. So, what I figured is I'll just start rubbing it on my head. Okay. And then we could maybe stick it to the wall or something? Yeah. I think instead of a wall, we can even try on this, this whiteboard here. Oh, okay, great. Keep rubbing. I'm, I'm right. rubbing. Okay, ready? Yeah. Here we go. Try. And... So that, um, that didn't, didn't exactly right. work. Yeah. Both of us rubbing our heads on the balloon. Okay. And... Go! Wow, that was a whole lot of nothing. Well, we've got a really heavy balloon here. And so. I feel like our heads are only this big, so we can't cover as much surface area of the balloon. 
Fortunately, you can also build up a static charge by rubbing a balloon on a sweater. Or if your balloon is giant, rubbing sweaters on your balloon. Yeah. But even that didn't work so well. I think what we need to do is come up with a better way to create a difference of charge. Yeah, yeah, let's forget about the balloon. You have something else? I have something else. Really awesome here at the Science Center. You want to check it out? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. Should we take the sweater and the balloons, or um, should we leave them here? We'll leave them here. OK. Yeah. So here's how static electricity works. Normally, everything has equal numbers of positive and negative charges. That's when things are said to have a neutral charge. But when you rub a balloon on your head, the balloon develops more negative charge than positive because it pulls electrons from your hair. The same thing happens in clouds during a storm. The cloud develops a negative charge when water molecules start bumping into each other. A lightning bolt happens when the negative charge in the cloud gets so big, the attraction to the positive charge in the ground gets strong enough that the electrons can make the jump all the way from the cloud to the ground, and you get lightning. <laughs> Heather and I tried to max out the static on a balloon, but a big heavy balloon just doesn't hold the same charge. That didn't, didn't exactly right, work. Yeah. But we're only interested in maxing out the static charge, and Heather knows just what to use. Wow. So this is the Ontario Science Centre yes. electricity show? Yes. OK, so where's the electricity part? The one we're going to be playing with is right there. So the giant mushroom. Yeah, well, it does look like a mushroom. We're going to make some sort of electricity salad. <laughs> All right, head on up onto that platform right oh, okay. there. And I need you to put one hand on that silver ball, yes. So the way it Nothing works. Nothing is happening. <laughs> Patience. OK. Once I turn it on, when I engage it, this is going to steal your negative charge. So it's going to steal your mm. electrons. So if it steals electrons, you're going to be positively charged. So it'll make me more positive. Even more positive. Yay! <laughs> Woohoo! I am positive! Here we go. Woo! <laughs> this machine is called a Van de Graaff generator, and it pulls the negative charge away from the person Whoa. touching it. <laughs> That is great! Instead of having equal amounts of positive and negative charges, you become positively charged. Woohoo! Science hair! Yeah! Like when you try to put two positive ends of magnets next to each other, each hair on your head starts to repel the others and be repelled from your head. Science hair! Dude! <laughs> so your hair stands up. Uh, yes. Woohoo! I can't see anything. So this is more of a machine to generate hair standing up, but it doesn't make lightning. Oh, well, actually, I have a demonstration in my back pocket. This is going to help us okay. to create lightning. This is our grounding rod. <laughs> it is my scepter of science. <laughs> and so we're going to use this to continuously provide that negative charge. That's why static. it's plugged in. That's why it's plugged into the ground, yeah. OK. OK, so then if you touch it to that metal ball, got it. Uh, not too exciting, right? So pull away and let's see what happens. Whoa! <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. Very good. The Van de Graaff creates a positive charge. The rod has a neutral charge. When the difference becomes big enough, the charge jumps the gap. Behold, I have the power of lightning! <laughs> <laughs> So it's the difference between the positive and the negative is what we want when we want to make a lightning bolt. Yes. So is there something we can use to make that happen? Large difference of charge? Yeah, I think I have just a thing. Oh, yeah? Yeah, you want to check it out? Absolutely. All right, let's OK, let's it. go. So you would like to move electricity from here to there. Well, what you need, my friend, is a conductor. All right, a little more arpeggio this time. No, not that kind of conductor. All aboard! No, not that kind of conductor either. This kind of conductor. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, hey, that's just a piece of metal. Well, that's right. That's because you're smart. This is a circuit. Electricity flows from this battery along the wires and into the light bulb. But Sal, you cleverly observe, the light bulb is not lit. This is true. That is because we have a gap in the circuit. 
And air is not a good conductor of electricity. Is metal a good conductor of electricity? Let us find out. <laughs> metal is a good conductor of electricity. What about wood? Nope. What about this horseshoe? Is a good conductor. Will this sandwich conduct electricity? Nope. No. What about this plastic fish? Nope. What about this pickle? No, pickle is not a good conductor. That's why we make electrical wires out of copper and not pickles. <laughs> you know, in case you were wondering. Lightning bolts make interesting patterns. That's because the electricity is searching for a way to get from one side to the other. But it's hard to see the patterns of lightning bolts because they happen so fast. Fortunately, using the power of science, we can observe these patterns for ourselves in a motion we can perceive. I'm going to use electricity to recreate a lightning bolt pattern. I've got two nails in a piece of wood here, and I'm going to attach electrical leads to both nails. Now, the electricity wants to go from that side to that side, but it can't. It has to go through the wood, and wood is not a very good conductor of electricity. Now, this is very dangerous. I need a special machine even to pull this off, so this is definitely not something you want to try at home. In fact, I'm going to stand way back here when I turn it on. Like water, electricity tries to find the easiest route to get from one place to another. But sometimes that involves branching out until the right connection is made. Lightning bolts do the same thing when they branch out between the clouds and the ground. Finally, there's a spot where the branches meet and the circuit completes itself. Then the electricity follows this one path, ignoring all the others. And there you go. We just watched a lightning bolt happen in slow motion. <laughs> Science. To our main experiment where Heather and I are on a quest to use static electricity to recreate a lightning bolt. Our experiments with the Vandegraaff generator had some hair-raising results, but Heather has another experiment she wants to show me. This is Jacob's ladder. Oh, so this is another way to make lightning. Yes. Lightning. Right, see, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Where do, how do we get it to go? All right, so we want to turn it on. Behold. Oh, turn it on. Not, okay. Not. Go. Oh. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> you can actually see that light climbing up between the two copper wires. That's why you call it Jacob's Ladder, because it's got the rungs of the ladder. Yeah. Between these two points, there's a really great charge difference, right? OK, so what's the difference? 10,000 volts, if you're looking at it. 10,000 volts. Yeah. And volts is how you measure the difference in charge. Exactly. Why does it go up? So it goes up because rather than just staying at the closest point, mm -hmm. is because we're heating up the air. Oh, so yeah. hot air rises. Hot air rises. And it takes the electricity with it. So if we cooled the air, it wouldn't go up? Wouldn't immediately go up, yeah. And there it goes, and it heats back up again. Yeah. That's neat. OK, so we have a Van de Graaff generator. We got a Jacob's ladder. Are there any other devices that make lightning like this? Ooh, yeah, there's other things like the uh, Tesla coil. Really hey, high. I have a Tesla coil. You have a Tesla coil? I do. I've got one at the lab. I've just never known how to hook it up. Oh, I can help with that. Yeah. Really? Yes. OK, let's do it. Great. Let's go back to the lab. All right. Um, well, should, should, yeah, no, yeah. I'll turn that off. OK. Yeah, safety first. OK. By now, you're probably an expert on what happens when you rub a balloon on your head, right? The balloon becomes negatively charged, which means it will attract anything of an opposite charge, or anything positive, or anything that is neutrally charged, like, um, well, like me. Look at the hairs on my arm when I bring the balloon close. Whoa! You see, the neutral charge in my body is being attracted to the negative charge in the balloon. So if something is negatively charged, what happens if you bring something else negatively charged nearby? Well, they'll repel each other. And here's an experiment you can do to make something fly using static electricity. You'll need a balloon, a sweater, scissors, and a plastic bag out of the thinnest plastic you can find. Fold the bag up and cut off the bottom. You don't want that part. 
Then cut another strip from the bag. This will give you a hoop of plastic. I find it works better if you break it and tie it again. Lie it flat and rub it with the sweater. This will give it a negative charge. You'll know you've got enough of a charge when it really wants to stick to the table. Then take your balloon and rub the sweater on the balloon to charge it up. Because both the balloon and the hoop have negative charges, they repel each other. Then put them together and it will repel. And you can get the hoop to levitate. Ha ha, a floating bag of static charge. But here's the thing. You need to keep it away from your body. Because if you get close, the bag will stick to you because you're neutrally charged and the bag is negatively charged. Pretty cool, right? Well, let's max it out. <laughs> Maxed out floating static ring. <laughs> no. uh, yeah! Look out, look out! Oh, no! Oh, sorry about that. Uh, oh, well. It was, it was fun while it lasted. I gotta charge these up again. Being a chef is my absolute passion. And cooking up science recipes is my speciality. I'm Buster Beaker, and this is Cooking with Science. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. My name is Buster Beaker, and welcome to Cooking with Science. Let's say, for example, I've spilled the salt. Oh, no, look at me. I've spilled the salt. Oh, there's salt all over the place. Not really a big deal, right? All you have to do is clean up the salt, put it back in the container. But, oh, no, I've also spilled pepper on the salt. But that's all right. You might be able to carefully separate the set. But, no, oh, dear, look, the pepper and the salt are all mixed together. What do I do? Well, here's how you can save the day using the power of science. All you need is a cloth and a plastic spoon, like, like this one here. Just rub the plastic spoon on a cloth, and you'll be charging it up with a negative charge of static electricity. If it's got a negative charge, it will attract anything that has a neutral charge, just like the salt and pepper. But I know what you're thinking. How will we separate them? Well, here's the answer, my friends. Pepper is lighter than salt. Observe. Well, if you hold the spoon high enough, the pepper will be attracted and make the jump up to the bottom of the spoon, but not the salt, as long as you've got it high enough up. Because the salt is heavier, you'd have to bring the spoon closer, which we're not going to do. And if you tap it off to the side, you'll make a nice little pile of pepper, and there you go, separating the pepper from salt using the power of science. <laughs> Thanks for watching Cooking with Science. I'm Buster Beaker. Heather and I have been on a quest to recreate lightning using static electricity. We've gone from balloons to a bandograph to a Jacob's Ladder, each more lightning-y than the last. Finally, Heather suggests we use a... Tesla coil. Oh, is this named after Nikola Tesla? Yeah, he invented it. Oh, one of the founding fathers of electricity, right? right I love on. Nikola Tesla, he's cool. <laughs> so how does it work? So the way this works is it is a step-up transformer, okay. meaning we take a lower voltage and bring it up and ramp it up to a much higher voltage. Okay, so normal voltage is 120 volts. That's what we have a normal plug-in socket. Typically, we're getting it out of, yeah, exactly. And we're gonna ramp that up to really high amounts upwards of 25,000, maybe even 250,000. Wow. Volts. That's a lot. And, and that... all that charge buildup, we're gonna see something pretty amazing happen. Okay. Do you wanna see it? Yes, I'm, we stand back there, right? Yeah. Let's check it out. And... Yeah! The Tesla coil builds up a charge which jumps through the air to this neutral rod. Just like a lightning bolt. We made a lightning bolt. <laughs> that totally jumped a long way. That was impressive. That was a really good one. So can you control it? Yeah. OK, show you me. Wanna see? All right. I'm going to lower my frequency. OK. Let's see what happens. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Oh, it's like a scattered lightning bolt. Oh, wait a minute. So you can play different notes? Play different notes. Hold, I need five minutes. Hold on. Okay. Okay. All I need 
is five minutes. You know, I was thinking is if you can make different, hold that for a second. If you can make different frequencies, that means you can make different notes, right? Right. So, oh, I don't need that either. Hold on. Ah, that's not what I need. Okay, one more thing. Can I get that hammer? Yeah. Okay, ready to go. So what is this? When you told me the Tesla coil could play different frequencies, I thought we could make different notes come out of the Tesla coil. So I programmed it to play the notes of the Science Max theme song. What? Yeah. You want to hear? Yeah. Let's try it. Yeah. <laughs> Science Max experiments at large. Lightning bolts. Created lightning. We have Woo! created lightning. Woohoo! Lightning dance. Greetings, Science Maximites. I'm Phil, and today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're going to be looking at light. Ah. Oh. 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 Hey. Oh. oh, okay. Just stay. That that wasn't supposed to happen. I was supposed to press that button, and there were supposed to be all these lasers and special effects, but it didn't. Well, today on Science Max Experiments at Large. We're not gonna be doing one experiment. We're gonna be doing a number of small experiments because we are going to do a light manipulation challenge. I'm gonna get an expert and she's going to challenge me to a game of light manipulation because I am the master of light. Oh, well, at least the green lights are working. And, okay, okay, forget it. I'm just gonna turn, I'm just gonna turn it back to normal. Come on, back it. I'm gonna work on that later. I'm gonna need an expert to help me though. Um, oh, I know, Anne would be really good at this. It really does look kind of weird in here, doesn't it? Oh, uh, well. You okay? Hi. Hi, Phil. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't see what I was doing. Here's your lab coat. Oh. Thank you for coming. Great. Now you're from Let's Talk Science, right? Yes, that's right. All about science education, just like us. Now you're gonna challenge me to a light to manipulation a, game? A light manipulation game. I've been working on a series of challenges since last time we talked. Each awesome. A little more difficult than the last. Well, this is gonna be great, because I am the light manipulation master. Okay, well, we'll see about that. Okay. Challenge number one. Take a seat. Oh, well, that's easy enough. I have written something on the back side of this ball. Okay. And I'm gonna challenge you to read it. Okay, well, I'm ready. I might be able to read it from here. Let's All see. All right. Okay, I see something's written on it, but I can't read what it says. What if you squint? It looks like a couple lines, maybe? I can't quite tell. Any ideas how to solve this challenge, Phil? Um, and I have to be in this chair? Well, you can get out of the chair to set up your solution. Okay. But when you read what I've written on the ball, you have to be sitting in the chair. Well, it's light manipulation, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, wait a minute, I've got flashlights in case the power goes out, so maybe I can use a flashlight. Haha, -ha. okay, ready? Pew! Um, huh. Doesn't seem to make it any easier to read. Yeah, I got nothing. Did you give up already? No, of course I don't give up. I told you these were gonna be challenging. This is nothing. I will figure this out. Um, I don't know yet. You're gonna have to get creative. I don't know yet, but I will think of something. Okay. Okay, I will be back. Here, hold the flashlight. Not looking, not looking. I'm gonna go this way. I'm gonna wait right here. Okay. Have you ever wondered why you end up upside down when you look at yourself in a spoon? It's because of light reflection. Light is made of photons. Let's say that these tennis balls bouncing off this wall are photons of light. Now, when the, when the surface is flat, like a mirror, the photons, they bounce in and straight back out again. But when the surface is curved, the photons don't go straight out, they get reflected. So now, this photon is going over there, and if we had photons on this side, they would go... I don't even know where those ones are coming from. Then, okay, so we got, we got photons on this side that are going that way, and photons on that side that are going this way, so 
the top becomes the bottom, and the bottom becomes the top, and that's why you look upside down when you look at yourself in a spoon. Okay, cut to animation, cut to animation. A lens works by changing the direction of light too. Lenses are made out of curved pieces of glass. When the photons of light pass through the glass, the curved surface makes their paths change. What was only this big before becomes this big when you see it. Lenses are used in microscopes to see things that are really small, or in telescopes to see things that are very far away. Both times they are making something small appear large. Anne has challenged me to figure out how to see a small object far away, and using a lens is my solution. Check it out, it's a giant magnifying lens, and I'm gonna use it to magnify the ball so that I can see it. Sounds great. All right. I set the lens in front of the ball, which Anne has turned so I can't see what's on it. I add a light. Shine it on the ball so that it's a little bit better illuminated. And then sit in the chair and ask Anne to move it so it's aligned. All right, so bring it to your left. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Keep going, right about there. Try bringing it closer to the ball. Okay, wait, that makes it, that makes it smaller. Try going, bring the lens away from the ball. Ooh, wait. Try a little bit further. Ooh. You're ready for me to spin the ball around? Yep. Okay. It says 71. Nicely done. Easy. Solved. Wait, wait, wait. What? That was just the warm up. Oh yeah? Yep, you ready for challenge number two? Challenge yeah. number two. I've got another ball. Okay. With something else written on it. Wait, are you coming back? Nope. Huh, but I can't even see you from here. Like, like how am I, huh? You're gonna have to manipulate the light. I have to see around a corner? I have to see around a corner. All right, I'll think of something. So you remember the tennis balls in the wall, right? Right? Okay, so the tennis balls are photons. What light is made out of? and the wall is a mirror. Now right now, the photons are hitting the mirror and bouncing directly back. But what happens if they come in at an angle? Like this. Aha! Those photons are reflecting off the mirror and going that way, which means if I want to see what's emitting those photons, I can see it from here. The same thing happens when you look in a mirror. Oh, okay, mirror. Whoa. The mirror reflects the photons over here. I can see the tennis ball launcher in the mirror, which means if there was a barrier, whoa, between me and the tennis ball launcher, I can still use a mirror and the photons would reflect off the mirror and it comes straight to me, which is how you can use a mirror to see around a corner. In fact, periscopes work the same way. Let's make a periscope right now. See, hey, it's dark in here. Oh, right, because I'm gonna show you my laser. So the light from my laser bounces off this mirror in a straight line. Ha ha, reflection. We can use the power of reflection to make the light go where we want it to. We're gonna... We're gonna build a periscope. Submarines use periscopes because it's hard to see when you're underwater. A submarine will extend a periscope up above the water. The image up here gets transmitted down here. So someone looking through the periscope underwater can see what's going on up on the surface. And here's what you need to build it. Two cartons of milk, two small hand mirrors, scissors or a craft knife, a pencil, and science tape, which is the same as regular tape, except you use it for science. And remember, if I go too fast, you can always find these instructions on our website. Step one, cut the tops off your milk cartons. Take your mirror and trace out a rectangle as wide as the mirror, then cut it out. Put some science tape on your mirror and stick it in the carton at an angle. Then put a piece of tape on the inside, then, get the other milk carton and do the same thing. Put a mirror 
on the inside and then stack the milk cartons together. But don't stack them with the, with the holes on the same side. Make sure you stack them with the holes on opposite sides. And here is what's going on inside. You've got your two mirrors, and one is angled like that, and the other one is angled like this. Light, from what you're looking at, comes in, hits that first mirror, goes down to that second mirror, and goes to your eye. You can use it to spy on people from below the table. <laughs> or from around corners. So there you go. Your very own periscope using light reflection. Did you know that your TV remote can be a flashlight? It's true. If you have the kind of TV remote with a little bulb on the end of it, then when you press the buttons, the bulb lights up. Yeah, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, wait a minute. The bulb did not light up, and I've never seen the bulb of my TV remote light up when I press the buttons. Well, that's because your TV remote works on infrared, which is a kind of light you can't see. But you might be able to see it with a camera. If you have a digital camera or a camera on your phone, ah, now you can see, see? It lights up. And because infrared light works the same way as visible light, in that it will bounce off a mirror, here's an experiment you can do at home. Bounce the light off your TV remote off a mirror and turn on and off your television. Check this out. You get a mirror, set it up just right, and then aim the remote at the mirror, and it turns off the television. Pretty cool, right? But now, let's max it out. I've got a complex series of mirrors set up here and I'm gonna bounce the light from the remote all over the room. And here's what that pattern looks like. The light from the remote hits this mirror, which reflects to this mirror, which reflects to this mirror, and then this mirror, and then this mirror, and then finally to the television. Isn't that cool? There you go. Maxed out remote light bouncing infrared flashlight. I gotta come up with a better name, but still, it's pretty cool. Oh, all right. Turn off the television and leave the room. I solved Anne's first light challenge, seeing something far away with a lens. It says 71! But now she's moved the ball around a corner, and now I have the solution. Mirror! A mirror will let me see around the corner. Clever. Right? Okay, so all I gotta do is put the mirror in a position sort of like that, I guess, and then I'm gonna sit in the chair. If you could help me adjust that mirror. Um, uh, keep going that way. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, stop. Nice, okay, go ahead and flip the ball around and I will read the message. It is too small. I can't, okay, I've, I've solved this problem though. Okay, flip it around. The lens, I need the lens. So we'll use a mirror and the lens to, good. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'm gonna sit in the chair. Here in the chair. It is backwards. Oh yeah, a mirror inverts the image, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. That's okay, that's okay, I can solve this. All I need, whoa! Other mirror is all I need to solve this problem. So if I take this mirror and I put it here, let's see. Um, there it is. It says 42. Nicely done. <laughs> I am done? ready for anything. What do you got planned for the hardest challenge? Are you sure you're ready for this? Totally. I challenge number three. Challenge number three starts now. What? Wait, 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 wait. No, no. This is a light challenge. How am I supposed to do a light challenge if it's dark? Mm, you have to get creative but it's dark. Well, okay, no problem. I will think of something. I will be back. Okay. Okay, careful. Wood. I'll be Whoa. waiting. <laughs> careful. So you already know about reflection, right? That's when the beam of light, say from my laser, reflects off this mirror and bounces in a straight line. 
But check this out. If I don't use the mirror and I shine the laser against the underside of the water, it also reflects just like a mirror. This is called internal reflection. If I uh, have a stream of water and I put my laser beam into the stream, you can see that the laser bounces around inside the stream of water. It's being internally reflected. And the laser isn't going straight anymore. It's following the stream of water down where the water goes. Internal reflection. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Phil, how does this affect me in my everyday life? Internal reflection, who cares? Well, I can tell you why you should care in two words. Fiber optic wires. Three words, fiber optic wires. You see, fiber optics carry information all over the planet. The internet, maybe even your television, travels through fiber optic wires. The good thing is, because of internal reflection, you can bend fiber optic wires any which way or around corners, and the beams of light continue to go straight down inside the wires and get out the other end, making it go where you want it to go. Internal reflection, science. Back to our light challenge. I've seen something small from far away, seen around corners, but now Anne has turned off the lights. But I have a solution. Oh, Anne, oh, Anne, careful. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot how dark it was in here. Okay, I figured it out. Okay. Ah, I have a flashlight. No, nope. so all I need no, to no, do no. Is hold on, here. hold on, hold on. What? There's one more rule I didn't tell you. What's the rule? You can't use visible light. How in the world am I going to do this if I can't use visible light? It's a challenge. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, here, hold my flashlight for a second. Ugh. I'm going to make a phone call. Okay. I think I know what to do. I'll be back. Okay. I'll be back. Oh, careful. Ah! Oh. Oh, hey, good to see you. Speaking of seeing things, let's talk about the rainbow. All the colors of the spectrum organized in a beautiful pattern. But what are the different colors? I mean, what makes them different? Well, it all has to do with the electromagnetic spectrum. This is visible light. All the colors of the rainbow. And take a look at that little black line that goes up and down there. That's the frequency of the light. Light is a wave. You see the wavelength is a little wider out here on the red side, and it's a little closer together here on the violet side? That's because every color of light has a different length of wave or wavelength. And that is what makes them different when we look at them. But if you think that's all there is to the electromagnetic spectrum, then you're mistaken. So what happens over here on the red side? Does it keep going? Yeah, it does. What? Look, we got infrared here, and then we got microwaves. These are the same kind of waves you use in your oven. And then we got radio waves, which are the same kind of waves you use in your radio. They're all part of the same thing as visible light. Huh? Let's take a look at the other end. Remember these short wavelengths over here beside violet? Well, does that keep going? Yeah. If they keep getting shorter, you get ultraviolet, and then x-rays, and then gamma rays. Huh? Pretty amazing. And look, it's all connected. From radio waves to gamma rays to visible light in between, it's all frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. <laughs> How is this staying up? So everything outside of the visible spectrum is invisible, right? Wrong! Ha-ha! <laughs> Bam! Huh? That is an X-ray, a picture we can take using this part of the spectrum. We can use special cameras to see outside of the visible spectrum. Huh? Huh? Right? <laughs> yeah. You get you okay, you got it. Huh? And look at these. These are night vision goggles. They help you see in the dark. They use part of the spectrum called infrared. For those of you keeping score, that's this part of the spectrum right here. Pretty neat, right? I would sell you these, but they're already spoken for. 
Oh, and here he comes now. Hey, Sal. Hey, how you doing? You got those goggles I ordered? Yeah, go ahead, help yourself. Thanks for putting them aside. Can I put them on my tab? Yeah, no problem. All right, thanks, Sal. Okay, see you later. Nice kid. He's always in a rush, though. Phil, is that you? Yeah. Do you need the flashlight? I don't, turn, turn it off. I can totally make my way over to you. Oh. I can hear you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right here, Oh, right here. Hi. Because I have night vision goggles. Ooh, ch check it out. Oh, cool. Pretty cool, right? That's awesome. So here's the spectrum again, and here's visible light. My night vision goggles use infrared, this part of the spectrum here with wavelengths just a little bit longer than the red we can see outside of the visible light spectrum. All right, I would say that's allowed. No visible light, and I will see the next ball. Have you got it set up? Uh, I set it up while you were out. Okay, good. I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit in the chair and, and see if I can see it. Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, I can totally see everything. Can you tell me what the ball says? It says, it says you win. Nicely <laughs> done. So let's recap. This challenge is the same as the last challenge. The light from the ball was magnified by the lens, sent around a corner by reflecting it off a mirror, and flipped back around by using another mirror. But this time, it's dark. So, using infrared light, thanks to my night vision goggles, I was able to see the ball and win the game. The light manipulation challenge is done. Science Max experiments at large. Time to turn the lights back yep, on. Yep, yeah. absolutely. Huh. What did you do back there? Um, I, I guess we blew a fuse or something. Uh-oh. Greetings, Science Maximites. Take a moment and imagine with me, if you will, a time when the only way to light your house was with candles or oil lamps. There was no electricity. That meant no power tools, no video games, no telephones, and worst of all, no TV. Fortunately, we live in a world of electricity. If you've ever lost power in your city or neighborhood, you know how hard it is to get by without electricity, even for one day. But where does it all come from? Where do we get this electricity that we use all the time? We make it. That's the cool thing. And I can show you how to make it as well. Check it out. All you need is an electric motor. Electric motors are pretty simple. All you do is get a battery and you attach it to the electric motor and that makes it work. There we go. Attached to the battery, it spins. But if you spin the electric motor, it creates electricity. And that's what we're gonna look at today. Creating electricity. We're gonna build a wind turbine. But first, you need an electric motor. And you can probably get one from a broken toy. Just make sure that the toy is broken and that the broken part isn't the electric motor. Here's what you need. Index cards or construction paper, scissors, push pins, science tape. It's the same as invisible tape, except I use this one for science. A cork, chopsticks, craft sticks, and modeling clay. And remember, all the steps for this experiment are on our website. To begin, cut the index cards into strips and tape down a push pin so it sticks out. Then fold over the index card and tape it together. Then stick the pin into the cork and repeat that step. If you want as many blades as you can get on your fan, you are welcome to do that. Next, take your modeling clay and stick the chopsticks in, then tape the craft sticks in between with science tape. Then take the motor and stick the cork on the end, then wedge the motor in between the craft sticks and tape it down so it stays put. And there you go, a fan that will spin in the wind. You want to adjust the fan blades so they all face on a bit of an angle. That way they will catch the wind and spin. There we go. Now when it spins, it will create electricity. I'll show you with this. It's a multimeter. And a multimeter measures little amounts of electric current. There. The hair dryer makes wind, spinning the fan blades, and <laughs> we are creating electricity. Now, pretty much all electricity that you make comes down to turning a generator. A small motor like this isn't gonna produce a lot of electricity, barely enough to power one tiny little LED, but it's a start. And a good start is all we need, because, mm, 
Today on Science Max Experiments at Large, we're gonna look at all kinds of different ways of generating electricity. Plus, I wanna find out just how much electricity one human being can generate. Although, one human being is gonna be kinda lonely. I'm gonna need an expert. Oh, I know, Anthony from the Ontario Science Center. He can help. I wonder if he's busy. Well, come on. Bill? So I was wondering if you could help me with an experiment. I want to generate as much electricity with human power. What do you think? I think that sounds awesome. Okay, great. Let's go back to Science Max headquarters. Is that the portal? Yeah. Don't worry, all the kinks are worked out. <laughs> I know what it is. It's this. Where did you end up? I was in the vents. Oh, I ended up in the bathroom. All right, well, now that we're here, okay, so this is what I started with, and this is uh, just, you know, an electric motor, right? Right, right. Um, so you can generate electricity, you spin it, so I figured in order to generate more electricity, you get a bigger generator? Exactly, yeah, the bigger the generator, the bigger the magnet, the more the copper, the more the electricity. Oh, uh, well, you know what we should do is we should just get an even bigger one, like a giant one that they use in like at a power plant or something, or? Mm, not quite, that would be too big for a person to be able to turn, it'd just oh. be impossible. So you think this is a good size? I think this is a great size. Okay, so that's that's good. This is called a multimeter. We're gonna hook up the wires. I will do black to uh, black. Black to black. And red. And as you turn our generator, we can see just how much electricity we're, we're generating. Okay, so. Here, you hold on to that. This, and, and I'll can turn start the turning. generator. Now it's time to play How Much Electricity Did They Make? 2.4 volts, yeah, it's not bad. Oh, 2.4, yeah, it's not great. That's just enough to power a small LED flashlight. Better keep trying, boys. I got some handles here that we're going to attach ah, to the perfect. end of the generator so yeah. we can spin it. Okay, let's try. Huh? No matter how fast I crank the large handle, I couldn't make any more electricity than before. Okay, let's um, try something else. I get, I, but it's a smaller handle. Perfect, okay, that's, yeah. That's good? Yeah, well, maybe it'll let us get more spins in. Oh right? yeah, because I don't have to make as big a circle. Exactly. Yeah, it's working already. We're up to like 3.5. Now, how much electricity is Phil making? 4.5. That's the same as three AA batteries. Maybe enough to power a toy car. Still a long way to go. Yeah, it's, it's a lot higher with the faster spins. Oh, all right, all right, you, you okay? I'm okay. Maybe we could use like some gears or something like that. Oh yes, you know, that's a good idea because the, the this circle that I'm making here, I can only go so fast. So yeah. maybe with gears you can do one circle here equals like 10 circles on the other gear. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, so kind of like the like the gears on on like a on like a bike. Yeah, the gears on a bike or something like that. A bike! Oh. Of course! Oh. Yeah, so okay, so we get a bike and we attach the back tire to the generator. The generator, and then you can use the pedals of the big gear to power the small gears. Okay, great. Right. We'll go get a bike. Yeah. Yeah, high five. Uh, All, right. All right. Oh, right, they're over here. This is a generator. It generates electricity when you spin it. But how does it work? What wizardry is inside? Well, actually, generating an electric current is fairly simple. All you need is two things. First, you need a conductor, like this coil of copper wire, and you need a magnet. Now, this is a galvanometer. It measures small amounts of electric current, and I have my copper wire attached to it. Watch as I put the magnet inside the copper. I get a little bit of an electric current, and then I take it out, it goes in the other direction. A little bit going this way, and then I take it out, a little bit going that way. Positive, negative, positive, negative. This kind of current that goes back and forth is called alternating current, or AC. It's the same kind of electricity you have in your house. But here's the cool thing, watch this. I put the magnet in and I leave it. It goes back to zero. You only get electricity when you move the magnet. All right, so let's create our generator. Instead of starting with a copper coil like this, what if we just had the magnet and we have it staying still like that? 
and we move the conductor past it like spinning. Hmm? It's good, but not great because we're only getting a little bit of electricity as it passes. So let's make it more efficient. Let's put in some more magnets, one on either side and one on the top. And now when we spin it, it goes past all of these magnets and every time we get a little bit of electric current. Well, this is how a generator works. If you take an electric motor or a generator apart, you can see there's a coil of copper wires on the shaft and it spins around like this. And on the inside, there are magnets. So there you go. When you put it together and spin it, you get an electric current. Or if you put an electric current in it, it will spin just like an electric motor. And that is how a generator works. Anthony and I are trying to create as much electricity as we can using just human power. But so far, it hasn't been going so well. It all comes down to how fast we can spin the generator. Maybe we could use like some gears or something like that. In order to get it spinning really fast, we're gonna use a okay. bike. It's just a matter of getting a bike, taking off the wheel, putting it on a stand. It is now a stationary bike. It'll be even more stationary once we screw it down. And attaching the generator. All right, the bike generator, bike -erator. What's What should we call this thing? Uh, bike nomator. Bike nomator. Mm -hmm. I like it. So, okay, let's go over what we've got here. Okay, so we've got uh, two gears. We've got a big one, we got a small one. We turn our pedals, and the, the big gear turns the small one. So this, this is the whole point of this build, is so that we can get one revolution here means a whole bunch is spinning Exactly. There. The right, more right. we get here, the more our generator spins, and the more electricity we get. We get tons. Awesome. And uh, obviously using bike, because you're using your legs. Uh-huh. The strongest. strongest muscles in your body. Awesome. Uh-huh. OK, so now what's with this horn? <laughs> That is a loud horn. I know, I know, I tried to warn you. That is great, I love that. So Anthony and I hop on and give it a pedal. We pedal as hard as we can and we produce a pretty good amount of electricity. How much electricity did they produce? We got up to maybe like 18 there. We did a pretty good job. That's enough for a power tool, like a drill. It's, it's good, you know what, this, this works well, I think, for keeping a good number for a long period of time. Yeah. So we can get up to like yeah. 18, 20, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, we can't really get any higher than that. Yeah, you know what we need is like one really hard pull like all of a sudden. That way you can get like a spike. Yeah, you're right. So it's like instead of putting all that effort into a going for a long time, yeah. you put all the effort into one quick motion. Exactly. Yeah, good idea. So you wrap a rope around here and then you just pull it. Exactly, exactly. And that'd be a really fast motion. Uh-huh. Spin it really quick and get a very high number. High spike, exactly. Okay. Ah. Uh, you know, we, we're gonna have to take the bike apart though. Ah. Uh, Okay, well, right. guess well it's yeah. science. Okay, cool. So I'll just get. Oh, you know what? We actually don't have to take the whole bike apart. We just have to take the generator off. Oh, right. Okay, okay hang cool. on a sec. I got it. And maybe we should attach the horn to the next thing too. some electricity. But what do you choose to generate that electricity? Hydro? Nuclear? Coal? Solar? Who knows? I do. I know. And soon, so will you. In order to generate electricity, you need to turn the generator. Turn the generator. One of the most common ways to turn the generator is to use one of these. It's a steam engine. Usually they're a lot bigger. You see, you heat the water to boil it and turn it to steam, which works a piston, which turns the generator. Huh? Pretty amazing, right? But what it really boils down to is heating water to make steam. Boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Coal power. Burn the coal to boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Natural gas, that's different, right? Nope, burn the gas to boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Nuclear power, that's different, right? Nope, it creates heat, which you use to boil water to make steam to turn the generator. Wind power, we don't even need heat for that. Just use the wind to spin the fan to turn the generator. 
Hydropower. Just pour water across something that spins to turn the generator. No matter what, making electricity always comes down to turning the generator. It's always yada yada, yada yada, turn the generator. Except for solar. Solar does not work like that. But other than that, it's always yada yada, yada yada, to turn the generator. And now you know your electricity generation. <laughs> Hey, Ramona, you want to come and give me a hand over here? My arm is getting tired. Whew, it is hot out here. Oh, in order to generate electricity, you need to spin a generator. Most forms of electricity generation work like that, but not solar. Solar panels like this one generate electricity from the sun's energy. So how do they do it? Well. This is a solar panel. Okay, it's not really a solar panel. I just sort of put this together, but it works the same way. There are two plates, and on these plates are electrons. I've got golf ball electrons up here, ping pong ball electrons down here, but they're all the same thing. Now, this happy little fellow is a photon, energy from the sun in handy dandy particle form. What happens is photons come from the sun and hit the top plate and knock some electrons from one side to the other, like this. And that knocks over some electrons. Now these extra electrons travel up a wire in the form of electricity and we can use them to do work for us. Then they change to the other charge, go back, and we start the process all over again. That is how solar panels work. But remember, it only works when there's sun and photons. <laughs> Anthony and I are trying to generate electricity using human power. Spinning the generator didn't work too well, but we found if we used some gears, like those on a bike, it worked better. You know what we need is like one really hard pull like all of a sudden. Using gears is a great way to get work done. The good news is there are generators with gears already in them. That means if we can turn the spindle once, the gears inside will spin the coil a lot of times. The only downside, turning the spindle gets harder the higher the gear. Anthony and I attach a spindle and then we wind up the rope, which takes a while. Okay, so the plan is, it's on a big spool now, yep. and you just run as fast as you can. Got it. And we'll hopefully get as many revolutions as we can, depending on how fast your top speed is. Okay, sounds I can good. Go, sounds good, I can be pretty quick. Okay, good, all right. Ready? On your mark. Uh-huh. Get set, uh -huh. go. <laughs> how much electricity did they create? 24 volts. Actually, not bad. That's enough to power their own personal scooter. Not too shabby, boys. We need like a hard pull all at once. Yeah, uh, something like really big. So what if we could get uh, like really high, like, okay. like up there? Could we attach the generator up there? You could jump down from there. Um, and I would hang on the rope? Yeah. Yeah, it's good, but I don't want to jump from up there. Um, oh, what if we put a pulley up there? That and would then work. the rope goes through the pulley and then back down and then I jump from somewhere much safer, like just on top of here onto a crash mat or something. That sounds great. And that's my full body weight on the, on the rope. That sounds great. All right, high five. Yeah. Tidal power in 60 seconds. By now you know that in order to create electricity, you need to spin a generator. Scientists and engineers are always coming up with lots of new ways to use natural forces of the Earth to spin a generator and create electricity. One of those natural forces, one of those natural forces is the power of the tides. You see, the water in the oceans doesn't stay still. Every few hours, the water, or the tide, goes out. And then a few hours later, it comes back in. So, if you attach a paddle wheel in the water and attach that to a generator, when the tide goes out, it creates electricity. When the tide comes back in, it creates electricity. That is how you create electricity using the power of the tides. It's water power. In fact, hydroelectricity is also using water power. Do we have, do we have time to talk about hydroelect? We don't have time? We, we don't, okay, come back, come back. Hydroelectric power in 20 seconds. 
20 seconds, uh, okay, hydroelectricity comes from water. Hydro means water. So all you have to do is find a place where water pours down from a height. And you can put a generator in there, and ta-da, you're creating electricity with the power of hydro. Ha 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 ha, ha ha ha, I did it. Anthony and I have pulled and pedaled, and now we're going to hang on to the rope and use our whole body weight to spin the generator as fast as possible. Okay. Okay. Crash mat. Uh-huh. Let me test it out. Looks good? Yep, it's good for crashing. So I go up here? Uh-huh. Okay, I go up here. Climb on up. We'll get you the rope. Got your helmet for safety. Helmet for safety, crash mat for safety. So we have the rope, and it goes up through that pulley, and then back down to our generator right. with a spindle on it. And as I fall, that spindle will turn. Exactly. And hopefully the speed of me falling and holding and yanking it down as hard as I can will be the biggest spike of electricity yet. That's right. We'll be measuring it on our multimeter. Here. OK. OK. Ready? You ready? Yeah. Here we go. Three, two, one. I jump down, and my whole body weight pulls on the line. <laughs> Our biggest spike ever, that was amazing. All right, high fives, yeah. biggest spike ever. Is it enough to power my house? Nope. How much electricity did Phil generate? Almost 30 volts. How much does he need to power his house? 120 volts. He's still off by quite a bit. Well, we've learned something. Nuclear, uh, wind, hydro, uh, solar, natural gas, coal power. It's all great ways to generate electricity. Yeah. And human power. Not so much. Not as good, no. but human power is more fun. Yeah, way more fun. Yeah, so you, your turn? Yes! Okay, okay, give me, give me, you take me. the helmet and I'll take the multimeter. Okay. And then we'll go and we'll do it again. Okay, okay. Wait, I gotta wind it up. Science Max is a show where we take small experiments and do them big. If you want to try these experiments yourself, go to our website for instructions. But not all the experiments on Science Max are the kind you should try at home. This one, yes. This, no. Try this, don't try this. A big yes, a big no. I, I don't know how you could possibly do this one at home. And remember, if you're ever not sure, ask an adult. Thanks for watching Science Math Experiments at Large. Center will like that. Awesome. And then we'll just weld it together, and there you go. This will be great. Yeah, high five. Uh, Phil. Okay, no wait, sorry, sorry, yeah, you got the thing. High five. Well, now I got this. Yeah. All right, I'll get new shoes, and we'll work on our high okay. five. Now it's time for one of my favorite scientific terms, the Magnus Effect. I am Magnus, and behold my effect. No, the Magnus Effect has to do with things that are spinning. Things like these cups. And here's a great little Magnus Effect flyer you can make at home. It's super easy. Get two styrofoam cups and tape them together at the bottoms using science tape. Then get some elastic bands and make a long one by tying them together. Take your elastic and you wrap it around the cup like this. Then hold the elastic on the bottom, remember, like that. And then let them go. They fly up and out. The reason why it goes up and stays in the air is because it's spinning, creating moving air over the top. Moving air has lower pressure, which means it's pushed up by the higher pressure underneath. And that is called the... It's coming. It's just... Oh, come on. Oh. Now, um, mm, the Magnus Effect. Yes. So, let's max it out. Magnus it out. See how much better that sounds? No, no, no. Max. Max it out. Check it out. Magnus Flyer 2.0 Stand Elastic Slingshot. Wrap it around. Remember, for the Magnus Effect to work, your cups need to be spinning this way. The front side rotating up. 
And there you have it, the Magnus Effect. Hi, Magnus, I'm out taking over the show. It is now Science Magnus. That is my effect, slightly improving the name of science TV shows. Science Magnus. Silita and I are maxing out our spinning top. Based on our small version, we decided to make one with as much mass as possible. So we got a 20 kilogram weight and welded it to a metal shaft. Will this work the same way? Well, let's look at the science. Why does a top spin? Well, let's start with Newton's first law, which is an object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. But the in motion has another part. That object also wants to go in a straight line. If you think of a bowling ball rolling along, it would need another force to act upon it to make it change direction. We say that a moving object has momentum. Now, a top doesn't go in a straight line, it spins around, but it still has momentum. It's an object in motion. And even though it's spinning, it still does want to go in a straight line. It's just that that straight line is here. We call this angular momentum. To make a top move this way, or that way, would take an outside force. So it stays upright as long as it has enough momentum. But when it slows down, there's less momentum and it becomes harder to resist external forces, like gravity, which will eventually want to make it topple. Our top has a lot of mass, which means it'll have a lot of angular momentum when it gets spinning. It's just a matter of getting it spinning fast enough. So should we spin it? Yeah, let's spin it. Let's You're see spinning. if we can get it to work. Hey, okay. Spin, 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 spin. Where do I go? In three. Wait, wait, wait. I can't get it. What? Go! Oh. Oh, wait, wait. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Um, uh, Not fast enough. We need something to help us get it spinning faster. faster. Maybe a rope? A rope, yeah. Should we grab a rope? That was my like idea, too. A rope, because the small one uses a rope. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll go grab a rope. So. Wrapping the rope up. I'll let you wrap the rope okay. up. I'll get my holder back on top. Spin it counterclockwise. We attach the rope and wind it up. You want to make it super clean. This is some of the best coiled rope I've ever seen. I'm going to pull the rope. You're going to hold on to it, but I can't okay. pull really hard because you won't be able to hold it up. Because okay. we don't have to pull hard. We just have to get it going fast. Yes. Silita keeps her hand on the block at the top, and I pull. Ready? Wait a minute. We'll get all the way. Oh. Whoa! It's spinning a lot better than I thought it would! <laughs> it's still spinning, but it's wobbling. Uh oh, careful. Oh, there it goes. It works, but just barely. It might spin better, it might spin straighter. Yeah. If we had it spinning, something help us spin it, spin it faster. Yes. Um, faster with more power. Faster with more power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a string. You can pull a string, but you can't push a string. Well, you can. You can push a string. You really can. OK, quit it. Quit it. This little contraption works sort of like a baseball pitching machine, but in miniature. See, there are two motors here, and the wheels spin together to shoot things out this way, things like this craft stick. Watch this. Whoa! Let's watch that again. Whoa! <laughs> but now, watch as I put a large loop of string through. What? <laughs> Pushing string. How does this happen? It... Hello? I don't suppose it's the Magnus effect? Uh, no, it's not the Magnus effect. No, that's... It's all right. I'll be in my lair if you need okay. me. Okay. Right. Bye. Right. Where was I? Uh, I believe you were at, uh, the reason why this works is... Right, pushing string. How does this happen? It's all because of inertia. Check it out. The wheels are pushing the string through fast. It's got some weight and it's got some speed, which means it has some inertia. So when it goes this way, it wants to keep going this way. But it goes all the way to the end and then, because it's a loop, it gets sucked back in this way, which means all of this inertia, you can sort of overcome gravity. Pushing string, science. Silita and I need to get our maxed out top spinning faster. We tried a rope, but now we're trying a drill. We get a wheel on our drill and use it on the outside of the weight to get it spinning up. 
A little faster. Oh, it's happening now. A little more. Okay. And release. Whoa! Yeah. It's kind of cool that it, it wobbles that much and it, it doesn't does. hit the ground. It worked oh. better, but there's always a way to max it out even more. You know what we need, Sylita, is we need that? a maxed out drill. Put it right on the top here and get it spinning very, very fast. Super maxed out gyroscope okay. whirly gig. gig. Is it just the top now? Gyros I don't know. Do you we want could to call it a gyroscope. Gyros well, it's, a, it's sort of a toppy kind of gyroscopy. This is a bike tire. It's pretty light, but I still can't hold it from the end of the pole like this with one hand. Nope, nope. But I can if I get it spinning fast enough. I just use this drill and then I get. Okay, so this is going to be awfully hard to do with one person. Uh, oh, this is the perfect opportunity to use the Trevor button. <laughs> Trevor button. Hey, Trevor from the Science Max build team. Uh, what are you doing? Maxing this out. Oh, right on. Can you give me a hand for a second? Sure. Awesome. Okay, so you take this, this drill, and we're going to get this wheel spinning really fast. Okay. I don't know if it's... Um, no, no, I don't want to know. I don't know if I remembered to... No, it's fine. Max it out. we got to max it out. So, because it's spinning, I can hold this heavy weight in the air. How is this possible? Because the wheel is basically a top. The forces that prevent a top tipping, angular momentum, are still working here. This angular momentum resists a change in direction this way, which is how gravity would want it to tip. Interestingly, these same forces also keep it spinning around me in a circle. So I can lift the heavy weight in the air just by spinning it. Awesome max out experiment, Trevor. Yeah. What was that? It's my science confetti high five I just made. Well, you know what we should do? What? We should max it out. Yeah, we can make a giant one and then a whole bunch of confetti in it, and then people like jump up and do more confetti that would come out, right? And then so what would happen is there would be all this con Trevor? Silita and I have maxed out our spinning top. The trick is getting something that heavy to spin really fast. We've tried a rope and a drill, but now we have a maxed out drill. So more power and more speed, which is perfect for spinning this massive top. Yes, and perfect for maxing out anything. We get it spinning and it works great. The top spins for a really long time. In fact, its mass was so large, it started drilling a hole in the concrete floor. We tried it again, but started to notice something. The drill is smoking quite significantly. Our drill began to overheat. Why? Good old Newton's first law. An object at rest wants to stay at rest, and an object in motion wants to stay in motion. The more mass we have in motion, the longer it will stay in motion. This will go forever. Well, not forever, well, not forever. but it, it'll go a really long time because it's got a lot of weight. But that same mass wants to stay at rest when it's not moving. We have to overcome all that mass wanting to stay at rest to get the top spinning. And even for our maxed out drill, that was a tough job. But once it was spinning, there was only one thing to do. Max it out even more! Silita and I come up with a plan to max out the top by riding it. You want to ride the top? Of course I want to ride the top! We can both ride the top. One person's going to have to drill this, so we'll have to take turns. Max Historica. This is Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest scientific minds the world has ever seen. And this is a wheel. Da Vinci thought to himself, wouldn't it be great to design a wheel that kept spinning forever? So he got to work. Something to keep spinning forever without stopping is called a perpetual motion machine. And it was an obsession of da Vinci's. Why, this is great. The bottles tip the water to the outside, making one side of the wheel heavier, which will keep it spinning forever. <laughs> Except it doesn't work. You see, what Da Vinci doesn't know is that science says a perpetual motion machine is impossible. But of course it wasn't for another 350 years till scientists figured that out. So we can't tell Da Vinci. 
what? Oh, uh, never mind. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest inventors ever. Even if not all of his inventions worked. <laughs> Silita and I got our maxed out spinning top to work pretty well. The only thing left to do was to ride it. We attached a large disc and a Lazy Susan. That's a platform that spins around on ball bearings. Lazy Susan on top. Lazy Susan. So that you can ride on it. Yes, and then we wanted to add this extra bit. Now, why did we want to add this? We need a little bit more um, weight on our top. Okay, so who gets to ride it? Um, I feel like you should ride it. I think you might be because right. Because I want to use oh, the drill. The super awesome maxed out drill. Okay, so let's do it. First thing I should say is do not, do not try this at home. We are trained scientists. Silita uses the drill to get it spinning while I hold it steady. Then I hold on to our safety line above and carefully rest my weight on the top. It works, but not for long. We take turns trying it out, but it seems we have another part of science working against us. Good old friction. Friction with the air and with the ground is what eventually slows the spinning top down. But our weight on the ball bearings of the Lazy Susan really increases the friction. More friction means the top slows down a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty cool. It was kind of terrifying, right? Yeah. Yep. Good old Newton's first law kept the top spinning, angular momentum kept it from falling over, and friction slowed it back down. The forces were always the same, no matter if it was a little top, a maxed out top, or a rideable one. There you go, Zoe Smacks! Experiments a large, giant spinning top. That's a spinning, that's as large a spinning top as I think you I think in the entire world. Let's do it again! Yeah! Hey, Science Maximites. Today, we're doing the egg drop experiment and, oh! Oh, no! Oh, no! Ha, 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 Things like this egg carton are designed to cushion the eggs in case it accidentally gets dropped or in case you want to stack something on top of it. The egg drop experiment is a great way to design some really cool stuff, and it's easy to understand. You take an egg and you drop it. <gasps> oh! oh. <laughs> so, let's get designing our egg drop experiment. First, you're gonna need an egg. <gasps> no! Why? <laughs> Everything's fine. One, two. Right, so where were we? Ah, oh, yes, you need an egg. And you need an adult's permission just in case you make a mess. Now, there are two ways to approach the egg drop strategy. You can cushion the blow or you can slow the descent. And there's tons of ways to do either of those things. Cushioning the blow, pretty easy. You get a whole bunch of soft stuff that the egg can fall into so it doesn't break when it hits the ground. Or slowing the descent, you do something like this parachute idea and it slows the egg as it falls so it doesn't hit the ground with as much force. Ah, and you see, the egg is totally fine because it went slowly to the ground. Now, this episode isn't just about dropping eggs. It is about material science. The kind of materials that you use make a big difference. Styrofoam, tissue paper, very light plastic, very light string. If we were to say, use different materials for our parachute version, say wood instead of styrofoam and heavy string and very heavy fabric, I wonder if this would work as well. No, it doesn't. So, there you go, Science Maximites. Ugh. Materials make a difference. And that's what this episode is all about. Material science. Cutting edge materials, new materials, and dropping a whole lot of things to see if they break. But first, I need an expert to help me. Let's see, who should I pick? Um, Mm. Oh, Jenna from the Ontario Science Center would be great at this. Okay. Come on. Huh? Hey, Jenna. Hello, how you doing? 
Jenna from the Interior Science Center is gonna help me max out the egg drop. Yes, um, but we're gonna need an egg, right? Yeah, no, I had one when I came through the door. Whoa. Whoa. So do we have some more eggs? No, that was, uh, that was the last one. But that's okay, because I think we should max out the egg drop, so we need something larger than an egg. Uh, how about pumpkins? Pumpkins, great idea. And now we need somewhere to drop them from. Oh, I already know that. We should drop it from up there! I think we're gonna need a control group, a control pumpkin. A control group, you need that in science. Right, if we're dropping pumpkins and we have nothing to compare it to, then we can't make appropriate observations. Right, so we just drop a pumpkin straight to see what happens. Yeah. Awesome, so uh, we'll get a whole bunch of pumpkins, yes. and we'll start building. Yeah, let's do it. And then we'll also probably need to clean this up. Wait, I got a mop over here. This is our control pumpkin. A control in science means a version you don't experiment on so you can compare the results of your experiment. So this is what a pumpkin does when dropped with nothing to cushion the fall. Jenna and I really have our work cut out for us because a pumpkin has a lot more mass than an egg, which means it's gonna be much harder to stop once it's moving. So now all we have to do is come up with a couple ideas to stop that from happening. All right, let's do it. Science, yeah. You want the best material around? Well, you come to the right place. I've got them all. I got you Flubberoid. Magnoplex. Flexoweed. Pastotherm. Bloopiphone. You need hydrogelatinous substrate? I got it. But you know, all those fancy materials are nothing compared to the good old-fashioned spiderweb. Huh? It... Hey, where's Gary? Ramona, Gary got away again. You know, people ask me, Sal, is it true spiderwebs are stronger than steel? And I tell them, it depends. When you look at a rope or a thread or a fiber, you talk about its tensile strength or its ability to withstand force before breaking. <laughs> but you're comparing different things, so you have to compare them by thickness. So if you're comparing a steel cable to a spider web of the same thickness, then yes, steel is stronger. But spider web is six times lighter than steel. So if you are measuring strength to weight, spider web wins every time. Gary! So why don't we build more things with spider web? Well, for one thing, it's sticky and difficult to work with. Almost finished knitting the spider web sweater. It's only gonna take me about 80 more hours. And it's not easy to train spiders. Okay, Steven, one long, non-sticky thread and you get a cookie, okay? And, hey, uh, where's Marco? And Petunia. Huh? But no need to train spiders now because modern science has surpassed the spider web. Enter carbon nanotubes. Huh? This thread doesn't look like much, but it is made of tiny little tubes made of carbon atoms. Think of them like a straw. But a really long straw. Carbon nanotubes are incredibly light and strong. Remember when we compared strength to weight? Well, steel is heavy. Spiderweb is about six times stronger by weight, and carbon nanotube is about 50 times stronger than that. That's so great. So why aren't we making everything out of carbon nanotubes? I'm gonna knit a carbon nanotube sweater. Well, first we have to make them cheaply enough to be affordable. There you go, one carbon nanotube sweater. $480,000. But material scientists all over the world are hard at work trying to find ways to make carbon nanotubes faster and cheaper. And soon, they'll be everywhere. And then spiders can go back to spinning their webs in peace. There you are, Gary. Where, where's everybody else? With Petunia and Marco and... What do you mean they're in my jacket? <laughs> Jenna and I are coming up with solutions to the pumpkin drop. We have three material science strategies. Strategy one, polymers. Something is a polymer if it's made of long chains of molecules. Everything in this category is a polymer-based solution. Rubber and elastics are polymers, so I thought, what about a trampoline? Look to the left a little bit. My left or your left? My left. Alrighty, here we go. And it works great! The pumpkin totally survives until it lands from the bounce. That's it, like it's a success and a failure. Balls are made of polymers like rubber or plastic, oh, yeah. so how about a bag of balls? There's the pumpkin. Whoa! 
I think that worked. Well, mostly unscathed. Almost there, almost All there. All right. Bungee cords are made from elastics, which are a polymer, and it worked, I think. I mean, it stopped it from falling, but never made it to the ground, unless we unhooked it. Technically, it survived better than any other pumpkin, really. Here's another polymer solution. This is cornstarch mud. It's a liquid, but if you hit it, if you impact it, it turns rigid. Right, so that could protect the pumpkin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and now, the rest. we add more cornstarch. Cornstarch mud strategy. But it turns out hardening on impact doesn't cushion the pumpkin much. Uh. Yeah, a bit of a problem there. I don't think this one, I don't think this works. And every scientist's favorite polymer, giant tub of slime! Where did you get a giant tub of slime? Episode six. Ah! 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 All right, let's check it out. Little slimy, all awesome. Now let's recap. This is our control pumpkin, so solutions work if they do better than that. Trampoline, yes, then no. Bag of balls, yes. Bungee cord, I think we need to disqualify that one. Cornstarch mud, barely. Slime, yes. Not bad for our first round. Science! <laughs> Advanced materials in 60 seconds. Scientists and engineers are always coming up with new and advanced materials. Some are for spaceships, and some are just for fun. I'll show you a few, hold on. Like, um, oh, this. This is a thermochromic mug. It's cool right now, but if you add hot water, it changes color. Um, ooh, this spring is made out of nitinol wire. It's also called memory wire, and I'll show you why. The reason it's called that is because it's a metal that remembers its shape. This one remembers being straight. All I have to do is drop it in hot water and it turns back into a straight wire. How cool is that? <laughs> Science! Oh, this is Ulexite. It's sort of a see-through rock, but it's made of perfectly aligned crystals. So it's not just see-through, but the image actually gets transmitted from one side of the rock to the other. Advanced materials are really cool. I can't wait to see what science comes up with next. Now it is time to talk about an amazing natural polymer. It is... Hagfish slime? Ugh. Um, still, well, hagfish, that's probably just an unfortunate name for the fish. I'm sure the fish itself doesn't... Ugh. Okay. So, hagfish makes slime, apparently. When a hagfish is attacked by something that wants to eat it, like a shark or an eel, it secretes a tiny bit of a natural polymer. That's this little white bit right here at the end of this test tube. Now, it doesn't look like much right now, but it reacts with seawater. Watch this. Hagfish slime is very interesting to scientists because you start with just a tiny little bit and add seawater and suddenly, you have a lot of slime. Whoa. <laughs> this stuff is actually pretty cool. Hagfish slime is a natural polymer. It's made just the same as the other polymers out of long chains of molecules, but it's naturally produced by a living organism. And because it's naturally produced, that means it's biodegradable. Hagfish slime, that's pretty cool after all. <laughs> We've had some good successes with polymers. Well, mostly unscathed. Almost there, almost All there. All right. Now it's time to try our foam solution. The first foam we use is fruit netting. Foam fist bump, boom. See, that didn't feel like didn't much hurt. at all. Which didn't seem like enough protection. <laughs> Pumpkin ball. Pumpkin, actually, pumpkin sphere. Pumpkin Wrapping sphere. the pumpkin in a sphere of foam. Go, pumpkin sphere! <laughs> it worked better, but not perfectly. Uh-oh. It split right down the middle. <laughs> pumpkin cube! <laughs> so? Uh, yeah. so, what is it? Wrapping the pumpkin in a cube of foam. 
better than our control, but you can see the pumpkin crush as it lands. Oh, no. Phil? Totally great! How much does it hold together? Not at all. I'll give it three cubes out of seven. We need more protection. Pumpkin helmet. Which leads us to a bike helmet solution. Which worked the best of all so far. Totally survived! Oh my goodness! Yes, I know, this pumpkin's a bit smaller than our control pumpkin, but our big pumpkins wouldn't fit inside helmets, and we figured it was only a fair test if we used a pumpkin the size of your head. This is why you wear a helmet, Science Maximites. Look at that. Unharmed. Expanding foam sealant. And we spray it all the way around the pumpkin. Expanding foam sealant is special stuff used to insulate gaps and cracks in the walls of your house. It comes out of a can soft, but then expands and hardens to foam. A full pumpkin completely covered in expanding foam! <laughs> Turns out this stuff is made for insulation, not absorbing shock. <laughs> Our beautiful foam pumpkin. I don't think, it, I don't think, I don't think it worked that well. So now we recap our foam solution. Fruit netting. No. Foam sphere? Yes. Foam cube? No. Bike helmets? A big yes. The only perfect pumpkin yet. Expanding foam? Eh, no. So that's it for our foam solution. I think we should move on to armor now. Yeah, all right. Foam. 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 How can they all be foam? Well, foam usually means something to do with bubbles. There's all kinds of solid foams out there, and they can be squishy or not squishy. And they're usually light. Air is an insulator. That means it does not conduct heat or cold very well. You see, I cannot tell this ice is cold until I get my finger really close to it. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Uh-huh, there, I feel it. And because foam is full of air bubbles, it makes a great insulator. That's why we make coolers out of foam. So what's the best, most advanced foam out there? It's this. It's called Aerogel, and it's 98.2% air. It is super light because it's mostly air, and it's a great insulator because it's mostly air. Air. It's great to pack things in as well, and NASA uses it on the Mars rover and in spacesuits because it's such a good insulator. Cool. Or not cool, because, you know, it's an insulator, so it would protect from the cool. We've tried polymers. Little slimy. All awesome. We've tried foam. Uh-oh. It's split right down the middle. Now it's time to try armor. Anything that protects the pumpkin in a shell of some sort. This does not look like armor, Jenna. This looks like pumpkin soup. Our first solution may not seem like armor, but it's a hard shell and the pumpkin floats in the water. <laughs> when we drop it, the bin explodes, which slows the pumpkin down a lot. The result? Not perfect, but still, remember, it's better than our control. So compared to the control pumpkin, that did pretty well. That was pretty good. Yeah. yeah I'll give you that. What is this? All right, well, we've got a pumpkin covered in knee pads. Knee pad pumpkin! Yeah. Knee pads are armor for your body. So wrapping the pumpkin in knee pads... Knee pad pumpkin! Drop it, Phil! Uh, didn't seem to make much of a difference. Maybe it didn't land on a knee pad. <laughs> Maybe we just missed it. We ended up in between the knee pads. I think that must be it. It's looking, it's looking a little rough. But using sports equipment gave me an idea for using an advanced material. It's called sorbethane, and it's used in modern sports equipment. It disperses impact. See, watch this. Okay, so I've got a hammer, and I hit the pumpkin here, and it goes right into the pumpkin, right? So take that. Now I hit it again on the sorbethane, and... Haha, -ha, see? Nothing. So I thought maybe this will cushion the, the impact. The result? Not bad. I don't think it dispersed it quite well enough. There is a crack coming right from the hole that you made with that hammer. Okay, so the hole might have structurally weakened the pumpkin a little bit. So the sorbet thing did a pretty good job, actually. Yeah. Good thing it is in athletic equipment. That's what it's for. 
Carbon fiber is a very modern kind of material. It's carbon meshed together and then glued down, so it's super strong. Super strong, and the pumpkin is contained inside. It's like double shields. Yeah, so can I test how strong this is? Oh yeah, this is the armor solution, so let, let's try it out. Here, I'm better try it. Whoa! But when we drop it, we realized there were too many hard surfaces and not enough cushioning. But the carbon fiber held up really well. Slowing the pumpkin down and cushioning it is the answer, which leads me to my final solution. I call it the lunar lander. That's what I was doing. I was coming in and like, right? Right. Yeah. See, I thought we were supposed to be doing armor? Yes. Um, so this is armor. I know it looks like foam, but you see armor like in a helmet, it's supposed to crumple to protect your head, right? right? So this will also crumple because it's not just foam, there's wood inside. So the wood is supposed to break and then the foam bends and the whole thing is supposed to cushion the impact of the pumpkin. Ooh. That looks pretty good. The landing crushed and broke a lot of the arms of the lander, but the breaking cushions the impact. Oh, what do you think? I think it's, I think it's good. I think we're good. Look at that. And now the awesome recap. Remember, the difference between doing science and just having fun is recording the results. Water bin? Yes. Knee pads? No. Sorbethane? Yes. Carbon fiber? No. Lunar lander? Yes. So, we've had some successes and a lot of failures, and we've learned a lot of things about different materials. And we have one pumpkin left. There you go, Science Max Experiments at Large, pumpkin drop, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Phil, that was awesome. And we still have one pumpkin left. Whoa, Whoa no, no, no! I got it, <laughs> I got it. It's fine, it's fine, everything's fine. No, it's fine, it's, it's fine. We, we I can got take, this, I got this, Yeah, we can take that up. Yeah, you, no, it's you got fine. it, you got it's it. Good. Careful. Oh, well. Oh, okay, well. Make that zero pumpkins left. Greetings, Science Maximites, my name is Phil. And I am opposite Phil. Opposite Phil. That's right. Blue lab coat, yellow shirt, evil mustache. I see. Anyway, we're looking at opposing forces today. That's uh, forces that make things go down and forces that make things go up. Right, things with more density and things with less density. Uh, gravity and the opposite, which is anti-gravity. Anti-gravity isn't really a thing. You're well, I have to do the opposite. Right. Um, buoyancy. And buoyancy's opposite, which is girlancy. No, girlancy is not the opposite of buoyancy. You know, you're not helping. Right. Not helping. Opposite. <laughs> Hello. Uh, goodbye. Hey. Today we're going to be making a gravity-powered boat. Ta-da! It's pretty easy to make. You just put water in the top here. Gravity of the water pushes it out the straw and the boat goes forward. And it's super easy to make. You only need four things. A piece of styrofoam, a plastic cup, craft stick, and a straw. And the tools you'll need, a pen, a craft knife, and the help of an adult, and science glue. Which is the same as regular glue, except I only use this glue for science. You take your styrofoam and you cut it into a boat shape. That requires the knife and the help of the adult. Then take your cup and draw the circle that your cup will sit in. And then you wanna put two slashes with your craft knife in there. Again, get the help of an adult if you need it. Uh, and then start carving out the styrofoam with your finger and make a nice little indent just like this for your cup to fit in. See, and then it fits in nice, nice and snug. So then what you wanna do is you want to make a hole in the cup. You can use a pencil. The hole has to be just big enough for the straw to fit in. First, you want to take the straw and dig up in this direction so that it will be a nice angle for the water to come out and then you want to get the straw back up into the cup like that and then glue it so that it is not going to leak any water. And then in the final step, and this is your choice, you don't have to do this, but you can use your craft stick and you can make a rudder or if you want, you can make a whole keel which goes just like that and it is right in the middle of the boat and this helps the boat go straight because sometimes the straw goes off to the side one way or the other. Okay, water powered boat. Actually, it's a water and gravity powered boat. You see what you do is you fill up the cup with water 
and the gravity of the water in the cup pushes it out the straw and the boat goes forward. And this is what it looks like in the water. You fill up the cup and the gravity pushes the water out that way. The buoyancy of the boat keeps it afloat and good old Newton's third law, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. The water going out the straw this way pushes the boat that way and it works pretty well. Whoa, if it's going straight. That's why we have the keel. Okay, so gravity powered boat. Time to max it out. 